Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, body positivity, and health at every size. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm a registered dietitian, nutritionist, and certified intuitive eating counselor specializing in weight-inclusive wellness. Join me as I talk with interesting people from all walks of life about their relationships with food. Uh-huh. I, I, I remember I was teething, little gums bleeding, Friday evening, it was all about eating. When I became a teen, it was all about beef, and now I'm ready for the world. Try and sink my teeth in, stacking it. Hey there, welcome to episode 87. My guest today is Daxel Collier, a fellow intuitive eating coach. She has a lot of great wisdom to share with us today about her relationship with food and how she got led astray by the wellness industry and sort of her early days of training to become a health coach and what helped her pull out of that and reacquaint herself with her intuition. So we talked a lot about building trust in your intuition and how that gets clouded over the years by various different things, which I think is a good theme for today, for this month of January and a time when the diet industry is in full effect. And a lot of my clients and online course participants have really been feeling it. You know, I've been feeling the pressure for this January, you know, the pressure to diet, the pressure to change their body, getting sort of seduced by different plans and tempted by things that are on offer. So I think we all need a lot of reconnection to our intuition and reminders to trust our intuition around this time of year. So hopefully this episode will be helpful in that. And I really loved talking with Daxel. So I can't wait to share that with you in just a moment. Before we do, I just want to share a couple of resources to help you improve your relationship with food. And the first is my new Facebook group, the Food Psych Listener Crew, which many of you have joined already. It's a private group for listeners of the podcast, and you can connect with people from all around the world to get support in healing your relationship with food and rejecting the diet mentality. There's lots of great folks in there, listeners who are body positive coaches and dietitians themselves, just regular people recovering from disorders ordered eating or eating disorders or working through the intuitive eating journey. So there's a great cross-section of perspectives and experiences, and everybody is dedicated to the body positive cause. So it's a very supportive, warm, wonderful community, and I'm so grateful for it because I only started it like a week and a half ago, and it's already grown so much and had so much great conversation. So I feel like it's enriched my life, and hopefully it will be enriching yours soon as well. You can find out more and join today at Christy Harris harrison.com slash community. That's christyharrison.com slash community. And that will redirect you right to the Facebook group where you can just click on the join button to be added. The second resource I want to share is my free quiz to assess if you have a healthy relationship with food. I'll send you your results via email along with more than a dozen individualized tips to help you make peace with food wherever you may fall on the spectrum right now. So you can take the quiz and get your results today at christyharrison.com slash quiz. That's christyharrison.com slash quiz. Finally, if you like the podcast and want to help us reach more people who need to hear the body positive message, you know what to do. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Would love to have you leave a review on iTunes. It really helps us out, helps us reach more people and spread the body positive message. It's really kind of a public service for anyone who's gotten anything out of this podcast. It's a way to help others find it and will also help us grow so that I can keep making more episodes of the podcast because this is what I love to do and I would love to continue continue doing it ad infinitum if possible. So you can leave us a great rating and review to help me do that. Go to iTunes from your computer, type in food psych to the search bar. And by the way, you can also do this from the podcast app in your phone, I should say. So type in food psych to the search bar, click on ratings and reviews, and then you can leave your rating and review right there. So thank you so much to everyone who's rated and reviewed so far. It's really helped us out and I hope to keep it coming. Now, without any further ado, let's go talk to Daxel Collier. I spoke with her via Skype from her home in the Bay Area, California. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. Well, I would say that for the most part, my relationship with food was uh, pretty peaceful up until I reached the teenage years. My mother was kind of a chronic dieter and she was always concerned about her weight. But her message to me was always that my weight was fine and so I didn't need to diet. It was a little confusing. So I was kind of watching her go through different types of diets and do different exercise programs. 
And while I was happy with her saying that like I was fine the way I was and I didn't have to do anything, I also like I wanted to be more grown up than I was. So there was a part of me that wanted to do the same thing that she was doing. So there was a little bit of dabbling here and there. Like I found her diet shakes in the cabinet and I tried those out for a while and like I would do workout videos with her. It's so interesting how that gets sort of wrapped up in like feminine adulthood. Mm -hmm. The chronic dieting is representative of what it means to be a grown up woman. And if you want to grow up faster, it's sort of natural to dabble in those things. Right. And all the adult women in my life were doing some form of dieting and body loading. So it was impossible not to see that as the normal thing to do. Mm -hmm. Even if it was like, oh, you're fine. The message, it was it, that you sort of did what they did, not what they said. Definitely. I wouldn't say I got too serious about it, though, until I was a teenager. At that point, some of my friends were getting into sports and they had coaches that were telling them to eat differently or exercise differently. And I became just through hearing them talk and watching what they did became more aware of myself. Like I, I had a friend who was thinner than me, who was feeling like she needed to lose weight. And so then naturally I wondered, like, maybe I'm not as thin as I thought. Maybe I need to lose weight. Growing up, my family was not very concerned with health or eating healthy per se, even though my mom was into dieting, it was really just about calorie restriction for her. So as a teenager, I realized that my friend's family seemed to be eating a lot healthier than I was. And I was noticing my friend's reactions to like the things I ate for lunch at school or the fact that I ate lunch at all as they all started giving up eating lunch which is sad to think about, but really common. What types of things did you have at home? I would say that we ate what is thought of as the standard American diet, although there's, of course, a lot of variety. Highly processed foods, very low quantity of fresh fruits and vegetables, a lot of chips, cookies, crackers, soda. These things were always around. And there wasn't a lot of pressure around eating at all. I was a notoriously slow eater. So when I was young, there was some pressure to get me to eat faster. But once it became clear that wasn't going to work, what usually would happen was I would eat as much dinner as I was going to eat. Like we usually ate dinner together. And then once I was done, everybody would eat the food off my plate. Oh, <laughs> so you were like allowed to be as slow as you wanted to be, but then everybody took the leftovers. I was, and it was interesting. Food was not scarce throughout my childhood, but... Everyone else in my family was older than me, and they had gone through a period of food scarcity before I was born. And I would say, like, they were acting out behaviors that are very common with that pattern. Like, no food was to go to waste. No plates had to be cleared. But it's nobody had the patience to wait for me to clear my plate, so they would do it for me. Oh, that's interesting. Did that make you sort of feel ashamed of being in touch with your body and going as slow as you did, or...? I wouldn't say ashamed. I think when I was younger, like I felt bad that everyone was always annoyed with me. But I would say at the point that they gave up, then I felt better. Yeah. So it was like, well, she's going to do what she's going to do. And we'll just wait until she's done. <laughs> right. Her food. Yeah. And it sounds like you were also encouraged then to have an intuitive relationship with food in terms of eating until you were full and not being forced to clean your plate yourself, even if other people in the family had that sort of attitude. Definitely. And I'm so, so grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a tough thing to sort of work out if, if that's been instilled from a young age. It really is. It really is. Yeah. So it sounds like then adolescence was sort of the time when it when you noticed like, oh, my gosh, we eat so differently than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt some shame around that time. Like I definitely felt that my friends were looking down on the way that I ate and if they were over at my house and I offered them chips, their reaction was just kind of like, no, we don't eat stuff like that. So that did start to feel weird, but I, like at a point in the middle of high school, it felt like I needed to make a choice. The friends who were into athletics and eating healthy and all that were a certain group of friends that I had. And I had another group of friends that were, I would say, more rebellious. I felt like I needed to make a choice about what kind of a person I was. And so I ended up making a choice to go with, I 
for lack of a better word, the more rebellious friends. And my relationship with food went with that. It's almost I tried to go to even more of an extreme, which was difficult given the way that I was already eating. But like I looked for the sugariest possible cereals. Like I prided myself in having cheese fries and an ice cream shake for lunch every day. And so I was as inactive as possible, like zero forms of exercise at all in my life. I guess I felt like like I had to make a choice and that was the choice I made. Then towards the end of high school, things got interesting because my best friend decided to go vegetarian. And so I did also, but I realized that I really had no idea what to eat, but still I was trying. And then I went off to college and that is where I would say my relationship with food really took a turn for the worse. Mm, What happened then? I no longer had access to a kitchen in which to cook. I no longer had a car or really any means to get to and from the grocery store. I didn't really have money to pay for groceries. And I had taken on this whole new way of eating, which I really didn't know what vegetarians ate. Mm -hmm. It's like you knew what they didn't eat, which was meat, and then everything else was sort of a question mark. Exactly. Oh, yeah. So that sounds really challenging. It was. It was a difficult time. And I was also really struggling with depression and anxiety and social anxiety. And that kind of snowballed my issues with food. Yeah. Did you sort of use food or the restriction of food to self-medicate that? Yeah. And it was because feeding myself suddenly seemed so hard and in like leaving my dorm room seemed so hard. I started feeling like maybe I just didn't need to eat. But then, of course, at some point, I'd be so hungry that I need to eat something. And then usually it'd be something out of desperation, like just like a bag of cookies. Or I was really metering out my food, divvying up like cookies at a time and like measuring like I can have this much at this time of day and this much at this time of day. And this is when I'm going to get another paycheck and that's when I can buy more food and everything was measured, but I was also like overwhelmed with the sense of, I can't feed myself. Maybe I don't need to feed myself. I don't know what to feed myself. Like it was just very dark and chaotic. Yeah. That sounds really confusing. And also there's a lot tied up together with, it sounds like the the realities of your economic situation and then also the the depression making you feel unable to feed yourself and this restriction you had put on yourself of being vegetarian. It's like all of it sort of created, it's like you were painted into a corner. You didn't really have a lot of options. Right. Mm. Yeah, so what happened then? The next year I moved into a co-op and part of the deal with being in this cooperative living situation was that we all had to take certain nights for cooking dinner. And that was difficult because nobody else in the house was vegetarian. And so it became a big conflict, but it really forced me to start researching what can I cook that will work for me and for other people. And there were complaints that my meals didn't have enough protein or they didn't have enough vegetables. And so I just started doing research and cookbooks and online and books about being vegetarian. And uh, I learned a lot about what vegetarians eat. And I think because I was on a schedule and there were going to be a lot of people really mad at me if I didn't cook, (laughs) I was forced to overcome some of my depression and social anxiety. And also in the nights that they were cooking in a lot of times, again, I felt like there was nothing to eat or they had made rice and I was eating rice and nothing else. So there was still the metering of cookies and other junk foods that was sort of sustaining me not very well. Yeah. So you were kind of like, if you're going to be fed well, you had to do it through the cooking yourself, basically. Mm -hmm. But I did have access to a kitchen and we did group grocery trips and we shared costs of groceries. So in those ways, food was more accessible to me. But we had strict guidelines about what we could buy. Coming from where? From like the co-op association or... Partly, it was confusing because ideally co-ops sort of regulate themselves. But yes, the building management felt that we were doing such a poor job of regulating ourselves that they kind of hired someone to step in. Oh, 
So it was some of both. That's frustrating. <laughs> so it's just like rules about your budget, basically. Yeah. And it's understandably difficult because we all came from different backgrounds and had different ideas about what are staples and what needs to be bought and what brands or what types are okay. And mm -hmm. I think it makes sense that it was challenging, but it did, it did get better over the years. And the second year I was there, a couple more vegetarians moved in and I learned so much from them about vegetarian cooking and eating on a budget. And that was a pattern that kind of continued after I was done with college I would say I learned a lot from roommates about cooking and eating on a budget. And, and I did a lot of research also because, unfortunately, I was having a lot of health difficulties. Aside from the depression and anxiety, I was having kidney stones, passing oh, kidney stones. Ouch. It's extremely painful, yes. And I was also, I had started having hormonal imbalances as a teenager, and it worsened as an adult. And I had a lot of painful ovarian cysts. Hmm. Yeah. So you're trying to figure out what was going on and how to help yourself feel better. Right. And I also had a, seemed to have a weak immune system, like I was constantly sick. And doctors really didn't have any advice for me. Again, when they did suggest something, it seemed to be with a sort of attitude like, well, we don't exa know exactly what causes kidney stones or ovarian cysts. So maybe you can try this, maybe you can try that, but really we don't know. And that was super scary to me because both of these things are really, really painful. And normal ovarian cysts are not, but like the inflamed one and like I had one that hemorrhaged. I don't want to get too much into TMI. Oh, but yeah. I had one of those too, actually. I was misdiagnosed with PCOS in my eating disorder days. And it turned out I didn't really have PCOS. I just had a hormonal imbalance largely from the eating disorder because mm -hmm. I was, you know, when you restrict your food too much, you don't have enough fat to produce estrogen. So your hormones get all out of whack. So that's what was going on. But I remember I woke up one morning and just was in excruciating pain, went to the ER and thought it was my appendix. And it turned out it was a ruptured cyst and it was awful. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a really scary experience, isn't it? Totally. Yeah. And it was, I mean, I don't know, you're timeline with it or when it happened with the kidney stones and also sort of in just learning about your relationship with food. But in my experience, all of that's like not kidney stones, but, you know, health issues and a bad relationship with food and binging a lot was happening at the same time. And so it was actually when I woke up with the ruptured cyst, it was like the morning after a binge. And I was like, oh my God, did I rupture my stomach? That was like my first thought that, you know, I had eaten so much, which is actually very difficult to do. But that was like my fear. Right. I'm just having a severe mystery pain. Usually the first guess is appendix. And every time I went in for a kidney stone or a cyst, they're like, oh, it's probably your appendix. And then it seemed really hard for them to get past that conclusion. Well, it doesn't seem to be your appendix. <laughs> but we're going to keep checking. <laughs> so that was part of what was so horrible about those experiences is it wasn't like I just went in there like, oh, you're in excruciating pain. We'll give you something for that. It was like, no, we need you to stay in pain so we can figure out what the problem is. Oh, um, God. Yeah. And those experiences really eroded my trust in Western medicine, I would say. And that started shifting me more in a direction of being interested in alternative health and holistic health and like complementary and alternative uh, methods. And I, after I was done with college, I started experimenting with different things like acupuncture. Did you study any of that in college or what was your major? My undergrad major was plant biology with a focus on genetics. Mm. So science, but nothing to do with nutrition really. No, it wouldn't have been if I had stuck to the path, but as I was partway through, I was feeling sad that I was never seeing any actual whole real life plants. It was all like tiny sections of plants on microscopes. So I took a couple of classes that I didn't need to take. Like I took a class on herbal medicine and another, I took an internship in a greenhouse and I worked some on the student farm. So all of those experiences did inform my relationship with food, especially like growing up, I really never saw a fresh vegetable anywhere. I remember the first, like we sometimes had canned green beans. I remember distinctly the first time I had a real fresh green bean. It was amazing. So 
having the opportunity for low cost, basically in trade for doing the cultivation and being one of the farmers, having a lot of low cost or free vegetables and fruits gave me the chance to try a lot of different things. That's awesome. Yeah, because you really don't develop a taste for it. And if, it, if your only experience of vegetables is canned or just not very good, whatever, like frozen or right. just non-existent in your diet as a, as a child, it's hard to start liking them. Absolutely. Yeah. So in an odd way, I feel fortunate that I still am of a mindset of like, I feel lucky to have fresh vegetables. It still feels like kind of a special thing, almost in a way somewhat that like maybe people who were deprived of all the chips and cookies and crackers and stuff that I had would feel that those things are more exciting now. Although I I still have plenty of room for those kinds of foods in my life. Mm -hmm. But they don't hold that sort of magic or that allure that the vegetables do. Not so much, although they had a a period where they did. So I'll, I'll fast forward through some of the story just to say that I taught elementary school for a while. And once I felt kind of done with that, I thought about what I wanted to do next as a career. And at that point, like I had radically changed my diet. I was very comfortable as a vegetarian. My health had improved vastly. And so I had this idea that I think a lot of people get that because I felt like I had sort of healed myself through nutrition and these lifestyle changes that maybe I could help other people do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I looked into first becoming an RD. So it's kind of the natural thing to do if you want to help people with nutrition. But I think because of my experiences with Western medicine and as sort of my natural desire to question what is mainstream, it didn't seem like the right choice for me. So I found a local program in health education, a master's in health education at JFK University. And I saw that I could do an emphasis in nutrition and just add on an extra year of nutrition work. So I decided to do that. And shortly after getting into the program, they told me in the beginning that their focus was on what is called functional nutrition. Mm -hmm. I looked a little bit into it and it sounded cool. I didn't totally get what it was. I was several classes in before I started to become skeptical about functional nutrition. Is that like elimination diets and that sort of thing? That's often part of it. Yeah. They say that they don't adhere to any one type of diet. And yet it's pretty clear that they adhere to a paleo diet. Oh, yeah. And so that, and we were encouraged to experiment on ourselves. And I had, so for one class, we were supposed to come up with a goal, like about a health difficulty that we wanted to work on on ourselves and like come up with a program for ourselves and try it out for a couple of weeks. So I had recently had a baby and so, and I was doing grad school So naturally, I found myself kind of fatigued and foggy brained. And so I decided that was what I wanted to work on. And it was difficult because I felt I was feeling pretty okay about my diet. But I knew that my teacher would not be enthused about my vegetarian diet. And through the classes, I'd been sort of questioning my diet and thinking about, well, maybe I should integrate some meat into my diet. And I'd been thinking about it, but I hadn't quite tried it yet. And that was the thing that made me try it. Mm. So the paleo mindset was sort of anti-vegetarian, it sounds like. Pretty much. They like to say that they're both into whole foods, fruits and vegetables, but it's a pretty drastic difference. And they're eliminating all the grains from my diet. Oh, yeah. And all the sugars. Yeah, it's so restrictive. It's very, very restrictive. But I think I've always been interested as an adult and experimenting with my diet and changing different things. And so I was not resistant really other than the meat part. But so I decided to give it a go. And very quickly, I noticed that my energy was getting much worse. My brain fog was increasing and I was starting to feel rapidly really depressed in a way that I had not felt in years. And so I talked to my teacher and my classmates about it and their answer was like, oh, right, well, you know, this is a radical change for your body. You probably have yeast cells dying and like bacterial changes. And it's 
natural that you would feel this way. Like it's just part of the cleansing process. I know. Wow. I've heard that from a lot of people that come to me having been on cleanses or elimination diets or whatever. And I think that's such harmful rhetoric because it's like, just sort of stick to it and do it harder and eventually this will pass, which is actually not true in that case because it's your body is telling you this way of eating doesn't work for you. That's what that is, right? Right. And it's pretty amazing that we we are able to fool ourselves into thinking otherwise. Like, oh, I feel just because I'm better. <laughs> I know. I know. It's like, this is the toxins leaving my body. Oh, because what we tell ourselves about how we feel has so much effect. It's It's really kind of remarkable what we can trick ourselves into thinking sometimes. True. And it's very part of our American culture around food and exercise in general. It's like you have to push, push, push. You have to suffer. And that's how you get things done. Yeah. This idea that it's going to get worse before it gets better and pain is gain and right. all that stuff. Absolutely. How did you respond to that when they said that to you? I was like, okay, fine. I'll keep going. And then a couple of days later, I was like, no, really, I can't keep going. And so they suggested that I could add certain carbs back in my diet, that I could focus on trying to eat more starchy vegetables and fruits, and if really necessary, maybe rice or beans. Oh, God. (laughs) So I went through this experiment. It didn't go well. I really remember giving my presentation to the class about how things went, and I just felt like everyone was looking at me like, she must have done it wrong. Oh. Because this works for everyone. Wow. So nevertheless, that wasn't enough of a learning experience for me, I guess, because I kept experimenting. And I eventually concluded that I did feel better with more protein in my diet, Mm -hmm. whether vegetarian or not, but that I really need a certain amount of carbs, as I think most people do in order to just function like my my brain, my muscles, like these things, they need carbs, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's a positive outcome, it sounds like then, is that you really were able to like, which I think is rare to be able to be scientific about yourself at all and sort of experiment with those things and like observe what's going on in your body and say, okay, this is what I actually need. This is not working for me. Because I think sometimes that that desire to have found the magic bullet can be so powerful. And especially if it's wrapped up in your identity or your an eating disorder or whatever, it's like then that gives it that much more power to sort of explain away everything that you're feeling, which was very much my experience with a gluten-free diet. Like I went down this whole rabbit hole for many years of having an eating disorder and disordered eating and thinking that the health problems that were happening because of that were due to gluten for kind of no real reason, like other than that people told me that was a thing. And, you know, I read some message boards and some very nascent research at the time about that. And so it was just like held on to this idea so strongly that I think I was getting a lot of feedback to the contrary, actually, when I would experiment with gluten free and I wouldn't feel better or I would end up feeling worse. It was like if I had been sort of in a stronger kind of place, I could have said, hey, this doesn't seem like it's working. But Mm -hmm. I think I was just so far in it that I wanted to believe so badly. And so that evidence to the contrary didn't really register. Right. Which is kind of a dangerous aspect of some of those programs that have people experiment on themselves, right? Mm -hmm. I wonder if some of your classmates would have, I mean, it sounds like they did kind of drink the Kool-Aid on that idea of everybody benefits from paleo or whatever, which is not true. (laughs) Yeah. It was interesting because there we weren't all on the nutrition track. So I still had classes with people who were not into that at all. And like some of them had their own things. Like they really believed raw vegan was the thing. And like that's why they weren't doing the nutrition track because they didn't want to be sold on paleo. So there were different perspectives, but I was willing to hear their perspective. I was willing to experiment on myself. And I was drinking the Kool-Aid to some extent. But like you said, I think... The thing that it came down to is that I had done a lot of meditation practice in the past, and especially in all the things I had done in attempts to heal myself, like I had developed a really strong self-awareness. And I think 
while I can be very stubborn about adhering to things, like I'm very stubborn about adhering to my own ideas. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't entirely tempting to be sold on someone else's ideas, but there was still a lot of peer pressure. Like once I decided I was going to eat grains, like I still for a while was only bringing snacks with me to class that like it didn't met the requirements until finally I just got really mad. I remember a day I came to class with a slice of pizza. And like we would have these conversations. They'd be like, oh, is that like the cauliflower crust? <laughs> like, I think I saw the recipe. Oh. And I just remember saying, no, this, this pizza has a regular crust made of gluten. <laughs> this is dairy. This is cheese on the top. I don't think it's grass fed. I don't know where this cheese is from. <laughs> Tomato. Yes, it's a nightshade. Yes, I'm eating all these things together. And yes, I think there are nitrates in the pepperoni. And I don't care. And I feel good. Mm, I love that. And I, I got different responses to that. I got some people saying like, hmm, maybe your gluten sensitivity isn't as strong as mine. And some people have been like, oh, I wish I could do that, but I know those things don't work for me. And other people being like, hey, actually, I secretly eat all those things too. Mm. So it, it was funny. But then that was around the same time that I took a class called Holistic Approaches to Weight Management, which I think is a really funny title and concept as a whole, especially now coming from a Hayes perspective. But this class introduced me to the idea of intuitive eating. And we did a few readings from Evelyn Triboli and Elise Fresh's intuitive eating book. And it, it immediately made so much sense to me, so much sense. And it really connected to everything I had learned about mindfulness and self-compassion and self-awareness. And so I latched onto it right away. But in that class, it was just like a blip on the radar and kind of the way it was presented. It's like, oh, this is a thing. There are lots of other things. Like there might be some people this could help. But as we know, a lot of people really can't be in charge of their own eating and they really need our guidance. So intuitive eating, not for everyone, was the end of that. So I, I had to go and learn more about it on my own and... I read the book and I did the counselor training with Evelyn Triboli. And I ended up doing my master's thesis on developing a health education program for people with type 2 diabetes centered on intuitive eating. Oh, wow. That's awesome. I really dug into the research around intuitive eating. There wasn't a lot at the time. Now there's so much. It's really exciting. Yeah. I know. It's just like proliferated in the last few years, it seems like. Yeah, the tides, I think, are changing. Although I think when you're wrapped up so much in intuitive eating and hay circles, it, you can start to feel like, oh, this is a thing that's growing really big and everybody knows about it. And then you walk out in the real world and you tell people what you do and they're like, intuitive eating? What is that? <laughs> yep. Or like, oh, is that how I'm going to lose weight? Like, Oh, goodness, yes. Ugh. I know it's so easy to get wrapped up in this bubble. I feel like I definitely succumb to that sometimes. I'm just like, yay, everything's great and the diet mentality is dying. But then, no, it's it's still alive and well out there. Indeed. Got to do more. Yep. <laughs> but that's so cool that you, you know, I actually had a very similar experience with intuitive eating where I had started to do all this work on the underlying issues with my eating disorder and not really work specifically on the food with my therapist, but do the work on self-compassion and developing a sense of self and developing some mindfulness and, you know, working on my inner critic. So all of that stuff was giving me these tools to manage like how I related to other people and how I related to myself just in life. And then somewhere along the way in my RD training, intuitive eating was mentioned also I think very much in the same way. Like, I don't even know where it came from, but if it was a footnote in some class or if it was that kind of thing where it was like, yeah, here's another way that people have tried and, you know, this might work for some people or like, you know, whatever, some bullet point in some lecture somewhere. But I remember it, it really jumping out at me because of all the work I had done in mindfulness already. Like, intuition was on my mind. And so I was like, intuitive eating, you can apply that to eating? Like, that makes a lot of sense, actually. So it was like, but then again, yeah, it was not fostered or given a lot of space 
in the classes themselves. I had to go do the work to learn about it outside of class. Mm -hmm. So that's really interesting because I I do really think mindfulness and self-compassion kind of can pave the way for some of those ideas to go down a little easier because it really is a radical shift if you're used to controlling your food so much and being kind of dependent on like a program or a plan or numbers or whatever it is to sort of relinquish that and let go around food can be super scary and foreign and not appealing (laughs) at first. It's huge. It's huge. Especially initially really hard to know the difference between what actually feels good and what you think should feel good. And so just in my own experience, it took, it was, even though I bought into intuitive eating immediately, like it was years until I was able to dismantle these ideas, even like paleo side about like, I should only eat these kinds of things and those kinds of things. And like, I won't feel well if I eat this, like I had to keep testing and testing and testing what, what really happens when I eat this. That's super helpful that you shared that. Thank you. Because I think it's sometimes people get the idea to do intuitive eating and read the book and get excited about it. And then like they try it and they have all these preconceived ideas about what's going to make them feel good or bad. And it's like, I'm listening to my body and my body says I don't do well with gluten and carbs, so I'm not going to eat them, you know? And I think that's that's a really dangerous territory, you know, when you haven't looked at what of that idea is actually coming from the diet mentality and moralizing ideas about food that have nothing to do with how your body actually does feel, but your your anxiety about those foods or your sort of assumptions about those foods will make you feel something in the moment or think you feel something in the moment that is not really true necessarily. Absolutely. I think in that, people start to feel, I don't know, I guess a sort of self-loathing or self-mistrust in a way that either they can't trust their body to know what's good for them or that they don't know what's true anymore. What they think they feel is not what they feel or they get lost. And I think the danger then is that then they kind of want to lean on a guru or maybe their dietitian or their therapist or their health coach. And one of my challenges as a health coach is that it's really not my purpose to tell people how to eat at all. And so there's this sort of way of supporting people through self-discovery and helping them be self-reliant and self-aware. And I think that's why self-compassion has to be the foundation as giving ourselves room to make mistakes, for things to be blurry, for things to be uncertain, to sometimes eat in a way that doesn't feel well and let that be okay too. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. I think that is super empowering ultimately to give people that ground to unfold, you know, and to to have their own experience because it is really hard to guide people through this journey without giving them anything to hold on to (laughs) and yet you know feeling like a little unmoored and having to sort of discover things for yourself and come to the awareness over time that like yeah maybe these foods i thought didn't work for me actually do you know that can take years like you said and that definitely took years for me too actually because i still had in the back of my mind like these myths from the gluten-free days that took a long time to die. And I still sort of was a little shy around carbs and gluten in general Mm -hmm. and sort of thought like, well, it's okay up to a point, but I don't feel good if I eat too much of these things. Or, and I also, I think the other thing that is common that I see that I also did myself was turn intuitive eating into a diet a little bit where it's like the hunger and fullness diet, as Isabel Fox and Duke says, she, it's like, you know, you're only allowed to eat when you're hungry and you're only, you only can stop when you're full. And if you don't do those things, then you're off the diet too. You know, I certainly struggled with that and had to sort of go through that and realize at the other side of it oh, it's all okay. There's permission for all of it. It's not just, and there's like a lot of situations in life where you have to eat when you're not hungry or stop after you're full or before you're full or whatever. So it's okay. 
And yeah, and that word permission, that permission is really critical. So it's, sometimes we get caught in this catch-22 where it's like you have a realization like, oh, it makes me feel good, feel better when I have breakfast. And then the brain wants to turn that into a rule like, well, then I must eat breakfast every day. And then if I don't eat breakfast, then I'm wrong. And then at least for me, that turned into, okay, I wait, I know I feel better if I eat breakfast, but I don't want anyone telling me I have to eat breakfast. So now I'm mad and I'm pushing a back, back against eating breakfast. It's like, it just feels like a crazy train. Yeah. Yeah. Because you rebel against the, the thing that you discovered as a self-care move, but then turned into a rule. And so it's like something to rebel against now. Right. And the only way to slice through that, again, is that self-compassion. And I have a sense of humor about it, like, because it really is funny, I think. I know. It's like we want to just create rules for ourselves all the time. Something that's joyful or exciting to discover or pleasurable can suddenly be like, well, now I have to do it this way because it's pleasurable and joyful. Yeah, but also no. (laughs) Right. And that's sort of perfectionism or need to do things correctly is a lot of what got most of us into trouble with food in in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So how did you sort of navigate through that then? And were you working with, with a coach or a therapist or anything in this time yourself? I wasn't. I was, aside from my nutrition classes, I was also taking classes in coaching, coaching in a more general sense. And so it wasn't necessarily nutrition or health specific, but because it was like within the school, naturally there was some focus on that. Um, So we did student coaching with each other. And so in a way, like I was the coaching process that we were taught, like I don't want to go on too long about it, but it's basically that the client is the expert on themselves and that they're the leader. The coach is always next to and a little bit behind them. So it's kind of what I was trying to hit on earlier about this way of supporting someone and really doing things themselves. And so in this way, through being coached by my peers, I had sort of qualified but unqualified support in moving through intuitive eating. Because of my own knowledge of intuitive eating, I was clear on my goals and what I wanted to work on and what I wanted to focus on. And so I just, I had student coaches there to witness and support me through my process. So that was a very interesting experience. Yeah, I bet. Because that's, you're going through it with them, but also they're helping facilitate your transformation and maybe don't agree with what you're doing in the first place, (laughs) right? Right. And vice versa, like I was supporting other students through maybe making nutritional changes that I didn't totally agree with. But again, because the focus was on self-awareness, I felt, I think we all felt comfortable letting each other follow the paths that we needed to follow. Yeah, you could sort of each do it on your own terms. Mm -hmm. And I feel that a lot with my clients now, if they are having thoughts around food that really go against what I believe in terms of intuitive eating. Like I don't feel an urgency to fix them, say, or change their minds. I'm more interested in being a witness to their process. And there's a lot of focus in my coaching on asking the right questions at the right time, asking powerful questions. I like that idea because that sounds like it's probably a way to get them to get in touch with their intuition. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what we're trying to do in regard to food and eating, but also, you know, everything. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that that represented a big change of thinking for me, too, because when I started out on the program, or so I was in the mindset of like, I know a lot about nutrition. Now I'm going to know even more about nutrition and I'm going to impart my knowledge on my clients. It's going to be great. They need knowledge. I have knowledge. It'll be transfer. And so this coaching paradigm really rejects that notion of coaching or it's really not so much coaching at that point it's more lecturing and so that not only changed the way that I work with clients but just also the way I work with myself so I have been through all of these health changes all of these lifestyle changes a lot of mental emotional changes 
and I've developed a lot more self-compassion as well and patience for my own process. And I can, I'm curious always about where I'm at with my relationship to food. And I feel like I've really moved past guilt at this point, which is so exciting and so relieving. Guilt is really heavy. And I just really enjoy going through my own process and helping my clients through theirs in a similar way. That's awesome. So yeah, tell us a little more about what your practice looks like and how you got there from when you began. Mm -hmm. After graduating, I had not immediately planned to go into business for myself, but as I looked at my different options, it kind of seemed like the only choice. Most health coach jobs out there, of course, are centered on weight loss. And it's usually you have to buy in some program that someone else had has designed and basically teach and enforce this program. Knowing what I knew about intuitive eating and haze at that point, I really could not do that ethically. So I started looking into starting my own coaching business and I completed my coaching training and my intuitive eating counseling training. And I just dove in and there was a huge learning curve especially like I had imagined originally, like I was just going to throw up a website and get a Facebook account and people would find me. (laughs) End of story. Right. But it's, there's been a lot of growth in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's a, it's a real challenge actually to get people in the door or to find also the right way to market yourself with this stuff. I think to put the message out there about what you're doing in a way that's going to resonate with people who need it, but also not attract people who are just looking for weight loss or something that's antithetical to your mission, which then would frustrate them or sort of make them upset to not be able to get that, right? Like, it's a delicate balance. The reason most people want to work on their relationship with food is that they feel that they're overweight. Even in, by the time someone gets to intuitive eating, I think they've had a lot of experiences with dieting not working for them. Otherwise, they wouldn't even be going there. So they've reached this point where they're done with diets. They're not really sure what's next. They're thinking about trying this, but there's a lot of fear about weight gain. And obviously, that's not on the individual. Like we live in this very fat phobic society, it seems near impossible for anyone to have no concerns at all about their weight. Even once they've bought into a haze mindset, like they've got their doctors, their family, everyone telling them that they can't possibly be healthy. So like you said, like how do people find us and what are they looking for? And I think I always want to be straightforward about what I offer. And I'm very clear that I don't support people through trying to lose weight, but it's heartbreaking I don't think it, I can say it any other way, but at some point in the work together, we always have to go through the mourning, the heartbreak, the pain of living in a fat phobic society to approach body acceptance. And I think you can, you can get started in intuitive eating without body acceptance, but eventually you reach a wall. And if weight gain is a fear, then body trust is not possible. And if body trust is not possible, then the self-awareness and intuitiveness of intuitive eating is not possible. That's a great way to put it. It is. I mean, that's exactly been my experience with clients too. You really hit a wall if you can't open up to the idea of body trust and mourn this promise of weight loss that's held out by all these different medical providers and books and articles and this and that that's going to be triggered again and again in the society we live in. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is why it's such an important piece of this work to dismantle diet culture and take down this notion that to be acceptable, you have to be thin because that's just not true. Right. I mean, there's a million messages to the contrary. And so that's that's the work. Like that's the emotional work to navigate that stuff. But I, I think, yeah, the real 
body trust can happen when you just say, well, come what may, I need to listen to my body. And if that means living in a larger body, I can be okay with that, even if I don't love that. Right. And it's not easy because you may accept yourself completely, but it doesn't mean everyone else will or uh, all of the accessibility and accommodation issues will disappear. And there's also this growing for people who are not necessarily concerned about their weight, people who are worried about their health and people who are developing orthorexic tendencies like I did. And for them, the fear It may also be weight gain, but it's just this fear of like, I won't be healthy, especially people who have experienced chronic diseases like fibromyalgia, uh, chronic fatigue, all of these things that sort of the paleo crowd are saying like, oh, that's because you eat grains. (laughs) Right. And then the onus of becoming healthy becomes on the person rather than, say, the environment or any other number of unknown factors that might have created these health difficulties. And people feel this tremendous personal responsibility to do something in order to be healthy or improve their health. I see a lot of that in my practice too. Right. Because I bet, I mean, when people seek out a health coach, it's because either something is really at a breaking point or they're trying to be sort of proactive and prevent anything from going awry with their health. Mm -hmm. And I think in both of those cases, like the world we live in today, make you vulnerable to all of these messages about like how you're supposed to eat and how you're supposed to move your body and what you're supposed to look like and what your morning smoothie is supposed to look like or whatever, that there's supposed to be one of those, you know, like when people are in a vulnerable state like that, which of course we all want to be healthy. We all want to preserve our health. And I think there's so much kind of deeper meaning tied up in that, like the desire for survival, the desire for longevity and the desire for acceptance too, you know, with the weight and body issues. It's like, we don't just want to be thin or acceptable for the sake of, I mean, we don't, we don't just want to be thin for the sake of being thin. We want to be thin for the sake of being acceptable and lovable, Mm -hmm. which it's hard to sort of untangle that. And especially when someone comes in the door and is like, I need to go gluten-free to lose weight or I need to go gluten-free to be healthy. It's like, there's a lot to unpack there. Yes, absolutely. It's quite a process. It is. Oh, yeah. Well, so where is your own relationship with your body and food in, in all of this? Like, how do you feel you relate to food now? I feel mostly at peace with food. An interesting thing I've noticed in recent years is maybe a sort of boredom around food. Like I I miss having food projects. I miss being like, oh, maybe I'll try eating this way or eating that and see what happens. But I'm okay. I mean, I am still experimenting like that in a way, but it's all based on the input of my own body, which that's intuitive eating, right? But I think there's still like when I... I've really had to get a lot of negative nutrition influences out of my spheres, especially social media. Because if you see these links come along, like, oh, the one thing you should never eat or I'll do this thing, like these extreme, like, I think it naturally provokes a sort of intrigue and excitement. I'm, I still find myself in the process of, I catch myself pretty quickly. And again, it's that foundation in mindfulness that's made all the difference that I can detach myself from my thoughts and and impulses and just notice things as they come along and deal with them and have a sense of humor about it. Like, should I click on that thing about the cleanse? (laughs) No. Right. I know that that sense of like, you are not your thoughts and not getting pulled along for the ride with the thoughts is so huge and powerful. It is. And so for the most part, I feel like I'm at peace. My relationship with my body has been interesting in that I think even though I didn't struggle with my weight, I had a very negative body image. And so I didn't necessarily have any plans to ever deal with that in the same way that I always seem to have plans to deal with my eating. I don't know. It just seemed like 
it just was what it was. I didn't necessarily see it as a thing that was mutable. Like I thought like, oh, I don't like my body because my body isn't attractive. End of story. Mm. So, but necessarily because I've been doing this work with haze and body acceptance with my clients, I've really had to face myself as well. And it's pretty cool. Like I feel lucky in a way that that was foisted upon me. And that I have had the opportunity to work with my body image and change the way I feel about my body. Yeah, because a lot of people don't ever have to do that work. Right. It's pretty amazing to be able to do that and come out the other side a little more accepting of your body. Mm -hmm. And also just to be able to, I think, see the people around you in a different way. Once you challenge your own self-perceptions about your body, I think it changes your judgments on people around you and your assumptions and just hearing other people talk about how they feel about their bodies and noticing that I don't feel that way about their bodies at all makes it easy for me to assume then conversely that although I may feel a certain something about my body that other people may not feel that way at all either and that it's not a fixed thing it's mutable or we can change our feelings and opinions I wouldn't say that I love my body. I don't feel like I'm in the zone of people who are really celebrating their appearance, but I have a lot of appreciation for the functionality of my body. And I mean, I think that's made a little bit easier because I had so many health difficulties and now my health feels pretty stable and I generally feel okay. And I have a lot of compassion for people who are struggling with chronic pain or chronic disease and the fact that that naturally makes it harder to love your body. I don't think we should necessarily be requiring of everyone to love their body, but there is, I think what's more essential is like we were talking about that development of body trust. Personally, my body trust has increased tremendously. Yeah. So you've seen that it's not your body's not going to lead you astray or that if you did have some sort of wonky eating patterns, that wasn't going to last forever. Right. And that if I do have a health difficulty, it doesn't necessarily reflect on me as a person. It's not that I did something bad. Or yeah, that even that's in your control fully because it's health is so multifactorial that there really are a lot of inputs and we don't have control over all of them. Right. And that, That was emphasized in my master's program, thankfully, but that was part of what made it easier to be skeptical about the nutrition track was that we were also talking about the social determinants of health and what actually is potentially causing these things aside from the evil gluten. (laughs) Yeah, I found that super helpful. We talked about that in my master's program too and like seeing that socioeconomic status or bias and inequality and stigma had so much more impact on people's health than what they ate or what their size was. You know, it was more the injustices or the stigmas that people had to deal with. Or like I thought it was so interesting, even just this sense of autonomy was one of one of the things that was a big determinant of health. Mm-hmm. Whether you have autonomy in your job and in your life or whether you're sort of beholden to someone else and feel trapped and don't feel like you have control can also make a difference in your health. Just like so deep, you know? And so, I mean, what that tells us is that we're really sabotaging people when we tell them that their health is all their fault or it's out of their control or making them feel powerless or degrading their health even further. Mm-hmm. That's a great point. Like, yeah, it's, you know, you're at fault for doing this to your health is, is a further stigmatizing them and adding to the toll on their health that was there to begin with. It's just funny because I think the intention of saying that is to empower people. There's this delusion that you empower people by telling them that this is all their responsibility when people go out and try to do something about it and can't do something about it, then it has the opposite effect. Absolutely. I know. It's like this sort of bootstraps mentality versus a recognition of the systemic issues that create health problems or 
whatever other issues there are in society and saying like we need to address those also it's not just it's not just on you it's not just on one person to be dealing with this stuff which i think is why like the haze message is so powerful because it's really saying there's so much else that goes into health than what you put in your body or how you move and your size has nothing to do with it actually so let's just take that out of the equation and focus on the things that you can do whatever your abilities whatever your means whatever social situation you're in now and maybe that won't be this way forever and you can make different changes down the line but sort of working within the framework you have now Mm -hmm. is really empowering because it's you have to be accepting of where you are to even start making a change. If you feel so loathing of yourself now or if the changes all feel so overwhelming and like you have to be a completely different person with a completely different body in order to have the relationship with food you want or the relationship with movement you want or whatever, then it's like you're not even going to take the first step. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So yeah, I think what you do is so cool and really awesome that you're empowering people to do this journey on their own. Do people find you often through like having read intuitive eating and then searching for an intuitive eating coach? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely one of the ways, all sorts of ways, personal references. I find that often what happens is that someone will talk to their friend or coworker or something about their problems that they're having. And this person will say to them, oh, you should check out intuitive eating. And they hadn't heard of it up until that point. And then they do a search and try to find someone who works around intuitive eating around them. It's exciting. I'm hopeful that as the word spreads more, that it will be more the norm than sort of a strange alternative thing to do. Yeah. And it it will snowball because now like it's kind of an uphill battle when you're introducing someone to intuitive eating for the first time. There's so many misconceptions to overcome about our relationship with food and what it means to be healthy and the importance of weight. It's doable, but you're working uphill. Whereas occasionally, like I'll have clients who maybe already read the intuitive eating book and were able to do some work on their own, but are feeling like they need a little more support or they are having trouble with one or two areas. And I find that when I work with people in that state, like we move very quickly. So my my dream is to have this world in which the idea of intuitive eating is widespread and not necessarily having to be an entrepreneur. I think a lot of us feel like sort of islands on our own, running our own business. And although we have some community online, I think there's this sort of loneliness about doing this work. So I sort of dream of right now, there's all these businesses hiring health coaches to do weight loss. I dream of a day where there's all these businesses hiring health coaches to do intuitive eating. I love that. I hope so too. I mean, the research is now out there showing that pursuing weight loss really isn't good for your health. So I think the more that gets out there and the more that people who are doing truly evidence-based programs can't ignore that evidence. So I think it it will start to happen. It's It's like progressive now, but 10 years from now, I really hope it's very much the norm. Me too. So yeah, I love that the podcast connected us and the online world brings people together in this way. And hopefully anyone who's listening who feels sort of like an island with this stuff or doesn't even have anyone around them talking about this stuff can kind of use the internet to explore more. But I think, yeah, having in-person resources is really helpful too. Definitely. It makes a difference. Well, so with that, where can people find out more about you and what sort of locations do you work with? Do you work with people in person and online or primarily in person or both? So you can find out more at my website, presentperfectwellness.com. I am working on moving to daxelcollier.com, but the presentperfectwellness.com will still forward to daxelcollier.com for quite a while. And I work with people remotely for the most part. When I first started out, I mostly saw people locally, but because my follow-up sessions are 30 minutes, what we found is that it's just easier to do the appointments by phone or Skype. And so with that, then I was able to open up my practice more broadly to non-local cities and countries. 
That's awesome. Well, people should definitely go check you out. And I love the work you're doing and love your story. So thank you for sharing with us. Well, thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to our guests for being here and to you guys for listening. And we'll be back again next week with another brand new episode. Meanwhile, I'd love to stay in touch. And the best way to do that is via email. So you can go to christyharrison.com slash email to sign up for my VIP list. I'll send you info about new episodes of the podcast as they drop, as well as exclusive sneak previews of new episodes, exclusive giveaways and other special deals on the products and services I offer, special tips on how to make peace with food and learn to trust your body, and a whole lot more. Sign up at christyharrison.com slash email. You can also subscribe via iTunes and leave us a nice rating and review, which is a great way to get the word out about the podcast and help other people find these important messages. Just go to iTunes from your computer or your podcast's app, type in Food Psych to the search bar, click on the result that comes up under podcasts, and then click on ratings and reviews, and you can leave a rating and review right there. And I really appreciate all the five-star reviews and wonderful ratings that we've gotten because it's helped us climb really high right now in the rankings. So we're currently in the top 50 of all health podcasts, and that's really cool because we're competing against some of the diet mentality, sort of traditional weight management and body shaming types of messages that I'm trying to fight with this podcast. So we've really started to beat out a lot of the diety voices, and I'd love to continue climbing higher in the rankings to get this message out even further. So please leave us a nice rating and review. It's so very much appreciated. And thanks to everyone who's left reviews so far. The music you're hearing behind me now is by a band called AWOL, and the track is called Food, used under the Creative Commons license. Thanks so much for listening, and until next time, stay psyched. Stupid or scared, no 